Hello again and welcome to the Into the Hemaverse podcast, your podcast for everything going on in the Hemaverse. I, of course, am Colin Vredenberg, and with me are my co-hosts, David Rao in the upper left, and Nathan Graperas in the lower half. How are you guys doing this week? Good, good. Pretty good so far. <laughs> so far? <laughs> so far. So far. Well, it's, it's the week. The week is young. Yeah. Well, we, you know, we do the recordings on Wednesdays to get them out by Fridays. But so it's, it's hump day. It's, you know. Uh, so what have you guys been up to this week? HEMA related and not. Uh, Memorial Day, you know, we had a, a small get together with uh, just my girlfriend and I and my parents out of their, their place and cooked some burgers and hung out. And um, but last week and bleeding into this week, I picked up a couple of books from Purple Heart to expand my human knowledge. And I've been eating those and they're, uh, they're actually very good. Yeah. It was the, um, the Jude Lou, not Jude law book. Right. And, uh, some of, some of the other ones. Yeah. Jude Lev actually, as I'm told. It's oh, pronounced. excuse me. That yeah. Is correct. Yeah. Excuse me. And I also picked up a copy of this, uh, Iberian swordplay by Domingo. Oh, that's a that's or Godino, a, Domingo. Domingo Sunday. Godino. <laughs> that's a good one. Does that have the, yeah. the Montante plays in it? Uh, yes, I believe. Uh, I believe it does have some Montante. It's got some rapier in it, and um, I, have, I haven't cracked it open yet because I'm trying to work through the uh, the longsword book, but which is really, really, really good, and it's also a really pretty book that matches your color scheme, Colin. <laughs> it's true. It's uh it's true uh so david it's, what have you been up to blue and jude and lou <laughs> um <clears throat> hema wise i mean i guess technically it's tangentially hema um it is so i just started uh, uh sonoma state university has a uh, fencing master's certificate program which is actually like classical fencing which is i won't go into the difference here but you know, there's a difference between classical fencing and modern Olympic mm-hmm. fencing. <clears throat> classical fencing being the classical version of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but they have this, uh, every year they, they have this program and usually it's like a shorter online program and then there's an intensive in person because of the situation. There's no like on or in-person intensive this year. I think they're going to do it in January. But so they did like an expanded online program. Mm-hmm. So I'm doing that, and it's mainly, um, it's actually, even though it's classical fencing, I'm doing it for HEMA, because um, it's uh, really focused a lot on pedagogy and teaching and how to teach, which is something that in HEMA we, we really lack a lot of, because we, for the most part, don't have any kind of tr- traditions, mm-hmm. right, and of how to teach, so a lot of people are just kind of make it up as they go, like, so having a structured like way okay this is how you convey this information to someone and even if it's not exactly the same as what we do it's still useful to learn those kind of like pedagogical structures so mm-hmm. anyways, I'm, I'm pretty excited about that cool i that's that's very cool i and it's nice to have that that uh certificate right or do, do you get letters after your name uh i mean eventually i don't know if i'm gonna go that far but <laughs> okay uh well let's see this week uh i've been reading the the meyer 1570 that i got a lot um but i have like this very specific way i read it right so i'll read it and then i've got the the bjorn ruther uh uh youtube on my on my tablet like right there (laughs) so like if i have no idea like like, what is he talking about i have no idea oh it's that simple thing that bjorn's doing okay cool yeah i got it (laughs) It's, it's been pretty it's been pretty fun i don't that's i think this is my first longsword treatise that i've actually read because i've read a bunch of rapier ones but never a longsword so this is this is kind of exciting and 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 no it i wasn't gonna read fiore sorry i know Mariana, <laughs> i know our our guest today would be very upset to hear me say that but i'm not doing that 
Uh, yeah. Corey so would be very upset to hear you say that. <laughs> And well, he would tell you. And he would tell me. And then he would beat me and all three and and three of my friends. Or no, and two of my <laughs> friends. Uh, I would be the one throwing the sword, right? Um, that's a that's a Fiore joke. I'm sure you guys get it, but I don't know if everybody will. Cool. So uh let's do some news. Uh I've got a couple first, if you guys don't mind. Um sure. I've been also this week, uh catching up on the Sacramento Sword School's Destreza series. Uh, this week is, uh, it's, it's every Thursday at 6 p.m. Pacific uh, time, but I've been kind of catching up on the YouTube channel. Um, this week is Phil Swift. Last week was uh, Bomprezi, which was a really, that was a really good one. Um, so if anyone's interested in that, I will leave a link to that in the description. Um, we also have a really cool, uh, thing that came out this week uh, via the Landschnecht Emporium. Uh, I don't know if you guys have seen this. I think that you both have. The, uh, the Dorothea, uh, it, it's, a, it's a Dussack, right? It's a, it's a Dussack trainer yep. uh, endorsed by uh, Keith Cotter Riley or, or even helped designed maybe, I think. Um, it looks fantastic. Here, I'll give you guys at home a little a little look um it is pretty pretty gorgeous uh i think they're selling it for 360 us dollars uh but they're sold out right now so i think it's a it's a waiting list yeah i got the handle uh i believe it was a prototype but it's pretty much the same i think it's the final version um and it's really really fun to play with yeah i can imagine <laughs> i can imagine uh the other thing that i oh the last thing that i had last thing that i had our special guest next week is going to be uh bill grandy of the virginia academy of fencing and uh he is currently doing a really cool thing put on by boar's tooth called the deed of alms uh so the deed of alms is like a charity uh event that that um there's a challenge every week and he has to complete the challenge um, and then you sponsor the person. So like you sponsor Bill um, and it's all Harness Vecton. So next week we're going to be talking about Harness Vecton, uh, which is something that I know <laughs> is kind of exciting to a lot of people. Um, which if you don't do German longsword, that is armored just combat. Harness Vecton. Oh, just oh yeah. I'm, armored, I'm, armored combat. I'm sorry. You, you're, thank you for, for <laughs> I, sometimes I forget that, you know, not know your audience, Colin. <sighs> You're right. You are absolutely right. Um, so this week he was supposed to run a kilometer in his armor, which apparently he has done. All right. I just hit the halfway point. I'm about to turn around. <laughs> what? What? what the hell was that? <laughs> But um, and and it was only possible because he got his armor back, which is I think the feel good story of 2020 right now. I don't know if you guys read the story, but he's going to come on next week and tell us the whole story, and I am so excited. Is yeah, yeah, the the story is absolutely crazy. Yeah, um, he lost his armor and then he found it and then he lost it again. It's amazing. Um, I will la leave a link to the um to the deed of alms information uh down below in the description please check it out it's really really cool uh you guys had some news uh nathan what did you have um well i uh, i just wanted to uh to let everybody know so um devin borman is a uh, an instructor a very nice guy that i met at capital clash a couple of years ago i think and i saw him there last year as well mm -hmm. um one of the nicest uh, nicest human people that i met before which goes for I, I think i say that almost every time i meet a human person so that's a cool thing about our community is it's full of nice people but um they're uh if i understand correctly they're one of the, uh, the few clubs in the world that have their own uh, uh facility that they own that's like a full you know full-fledged professional facility and throughout all of this uh all this COVID 19 stuff they've uh, they've been hit really hard by it and they've been putting together a crowdfunder and a gofundme to kind of help help everything help them keep everything going 
uh, which is really awesome that uh, the community is really coming together and, and donating as much as they can to, uh, to help them out. And I think that they're offering like online classes in exchange for donations and all that stuff. So if you want to get some more online work in, you know, other than whatever your local club might be putting out, you know, the club that you generally attend might be putting out every, every week or month or whatever, uh, that's definitely something to look into. And then uh, I think Devin is a really quality guy that knows this stuff really, really well. So that's awesome. Yeah, I, uh, I had the pleasure of meeting Devin a couple of times, but it was only this, this, um, this recent clash that I was really like, I, I actually got some, some time to actually spend with him, and he is top notch, great sense of humor. Uh, and <laughs> he, he, I, I told this, I'm going to tell the story until the end of the, to- end of time, but uh, I came in on him and Nathan having kind of a, a, a exchange of ideas session with my daughter, and he turned to me and said, Oh, Colin, is that yours? <laughs> In reference to my daughter, I'm like, oh, we're going to be friends now. <laughs> uh, he's a great guy. And uh, yeah, I will leave a link to that as well down in the description. Uh, do we have anything else for news? I don't. No, I think. I mean, I'm sure there are other things happening out there. Yeah, it's it's we tough. We may not be aware of. It's tough to curate. You know, I can only spend so much time on Reddit slash WMA, so... <laughs> <laughs> and really you should spend as little little time there as possible for your for your mental health but you know it, it is uh it is a great way to find like kind of put your thumb on the pulse of what's going on uh around the the hemaverse all right so we let's let's talk about our guest uh we have a special guest this week i haven't brought her in yet um but it is mariana lopez uh who like obviously we all know um, but a little introduction. Um, she is a multi gold medalist in, I think, all three weapons now. A uh, celebrated coach with a f- with at least one medalist student. I said many many medalist students, and she corrected me. She says I don't. I think it's only one. Uh, and she is the co founder of uh, Esfinges, which is an international HEMA network to unite and support women martial artists. Uh, let me bring her on in and let's chat hello mariana and welcome to the into the hemaverse hi <laughs> our very first guest on the program uh how was is, how is your week this week? Let's start off with a softball. Uh, fun. I've been doing a bunch of arts and crafts and teaching some private lessons and lifting a lot of heavy equipment. Um, so I'm sore. <laughs> nice. Well, that's good exercise. Uh, I've been moving some industrial shelving. 1010 do not recommend. <laughs> Fair. Uh so let's let's start off. Um, I gave you a little bit of an introduction, but uh, maybe talk talk to us. Like, tell us tell us a little bit about yourself. Like, obviously, we all know you, but tell the tell our podcast listeners a little bit about yourself, uh, where you come from in HEMA, and kind of what led you on your on your HEMA journey in, uh, in forever for- ago. <laughs> yeah. For, forever ago but but give us the um give us the uh 10 minute version all right 10 minute version so my full name because many people know me as perica because that's how i'm on the internet my full name is mariana lopez i am from mexico and i am actually from a really really small town called silao which is the middle of nowhere um grow up going to the nearby city because that was more of a place rather than my small town but i'm, I'm from like a really really small town um, I studied international relations, which I think is important to mention, probably because of your conversations. Yeah, um, so. I'm, I think I'm 29 years old because my birthday was right during COVID, so I'm not sure what my current age is right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> and long story short, always been interested in martial arts, couldn't find anything fitting. The whole idea of doing tests was terrifying, you know, for your belt and everything. Mm. Hobby. Um, I used to do reenactment, um, and I'm going to say the dangerous words, cosplay, 
And in one event, I tried to figure it out if sword fighting was a thing. One person who happened to go to the U.S. for vacations happened to see someone using a sword that happened to figure it out about Fiore that happened to be at that same spot when I said it out loud. So we made a workshop that was like the, it was, it was good for the time. Um, nowadays, it will be the worst workshop you've ever seen in your life. But at the time, it was pretty great. Um, and from there, I essentially blackmail slash um, talent my brother into starting a HEMA club. Um, and that's essentially how I started almost 12 years ago. 12 years ago. Wow. Yeah. And, and, and how far you've come in distance and, and in, and in expertise. <laughs> uh, and in height, cause in height, no, in height, I haven't come any further. Um, <laughs> <laughs> still 411. Uh, well, I've had a club, dissolved that club, had another club, got married to an American, fly over to be in the U S uh, had to completely switch my language, which was, interesting uh and i am a coach at virginia academy of fencing um i have also run several seminars we'll start with that one first one which was like a camp tiny thing which we learned the basic cuts Mm -hmm. and i've been running international events in mexico which is how i met my husband and uh, now i also work for capital clash um i also started speaking his which is the largest and the first women uh, organization of HEMA in, oh, I don't know the year, but my fourth year after HEMA. So it has been almost ten, 10 years since we started it. Well, no, eight, something like math, not my well, thing, minus four, but you eight, get eight. the idea. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Let's actually, let's talk about those fringes a little bit because um, first of all, my daughter loves the t-shirts, uh, especially the toddler sizes. Good call on those. Um, let's talk about his fringes a little bit. So. Uh, it is an international community, right? Um, which I'm, I'm sure gets difficult. Like there's gotta be tons of dif- difficulties, but the, the kind of topics that you guys approach specifically, I'm sure there's a lot of difficulties there. Um, not just nationality and background, but specifically like for women. Can you, can you talk to us a little bit about some of the challenges that Isfinge has faced in the, in the early stages and then, and then uh, now? So there's always been like, we've had issues on the outside and on the inside and they're really different. So the one that I think is the biggest thing and that will forever be an issue and people don't realize this is communication. Mm. Cause different countries, right? Translating words, you say one word, it doesn't mean the same to you that it means to another person and it gets out of context and one well-intended comment will sound awful or one awful comment will fly by because everyone is giving like the benefit of the doubt. Like I think communication is the biggest one. Um, and the other thing is like when we read the internet, we always think that people read the internet from the same place that we're standing from. Mm -hmm. Like this is my house. This is my reality. And I read the internet like that. So to me, everything I read, I read it like it's a Mexican living in the U S who is a little bit childish writing it. (laughs) Right. Um, And so then it comes by that it's not that way because I remember this one time, this was, it happens very often in which someone will write something, a very honest question, that it sounds really backwards minded to very open minded countries. So mm-hmm. to Europeans and to Americans, it's like this is like super, I don't know, conservative, like very, I don't even know how to phrase it, like almost like this is very, like slightly reaching on the Uh, misogynistic stage like why are you so close-minded and then when you look at the person who wrote the text and you look at the country where they come from it ends up being that for their country and for their circumstances they're super open-minded and they're already being really challenging so I think that we tend to forget that everyone comes from a place and sure we should not let them just hang up in positions that might not be great but we cannot just push people 
like right away hoping for them to catch up to a place where we're at when our history is completely different. Oh yeah. And I think that's one sense. of the biggest issues that we have yeah. on the inside. So like I, I can imagine that, especially since even in the last, you know, eight years that you've been doing this, um, our lexicon for most of these things, like um, just LGBT plus uh, just the terminology in English is, has changed so radically um, keeping up with that in like, you know, four or five different languages probably, probably <laughs> becomes a little bit difficult, right? And in places where it's legal to be that way in some countries, because there's, you have to think, putting this in context, there are people in HEMA whose countries punish people over being members of those communities. Mm. And we drag them to an internet to belong to HEMA where Luckily, we do mention that a little bit more often. But, for example, another one that happens very funny is on the outside, right? When, especially the first year doing a uh a lot of people was like, why do you need these? This is wrong. You're just like, no, this is, this is terrible. And it's very funny because Mexicans, uh, people from Asia will get it right away. And countries where they're more equal, like particularly Nordic countries or like we barely have any French members until later years because they were like, what's the point, right? And other countries where the women's situation is the same is like, yes, we need somewhere because there's nowhere mm. and no one I can talk to about these things. Um, and with the LGBTQ community, that's another, that's another big one because depending where you, not just depending where you come from, people are really scared about including those topics. Yeah. Well, and they always wonder, like, why do I have to? Well, speaking of – and speaking of inclusivity, I mean, you are creating – like, the goal of Asfinges seems to be inclusivity, right? You want to include all of the people that are normally excluded from the community, but that balance of inclusion-exclusion, right? It's tough, you know, to for somebody – like, like uh, a cis man who wants to join, right, obviously – like this, this isn't the space for you. Um, but to balance that exclusivity, to create a a balance between uh, including women, uh, it's got to be t- it's got to be t- difficult to navigate too, right? It's it's actually pretty terrible. And there's some experiments that we've tried to do that still don't work the way that I would like to. Mm-hmm. But the goal is first, you need to feel safe and people were is like what do you mean by safety and safety doesn't necessarily mean that i feel endangered when i'm with men but coming from a perspective in which there will be ladies calling my mom over the phone telling her that it was not okay for her to let me do fencing it was important for me to find other people who will relate to that experience where i can talk about it without having to explain myself mm-hmm. without having to justify what my you know what my country is about women uh mexico is not that bad but it's not that great so just just quick note, um, in a place where I don't like, you just don't have to explain what being a woman is, mm-hmm. and then people were terrified. It's like, well, you're you're closing that up, so then men won't learn. So then we're trying to figure out how to make those big deep conversations that women might not feel that comfortable speaking with everyone, and then write blogs or before it, make information that makes it out there so the other people can learn about them. But my first goal is to allow women to feel comfortable Mm. so they can continue to push through the hardships of doing an an activity that is not that welcome into other places. Or so they don't feel just lonely because in many clubs, they're the only ones. So they don't have to deal with any gender issues. They're the only ones. And then they they kind of become kind of like tokens in there. And it's like, yeah, we we actually uh, talked about this a long, long time ago. I'm not sure if you remember, but we talked about specifically just the 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 simple act of asking a question uh, during like a HEMA seminar, right? Whereas a lot of times you're just like, ooh, like uh, a woman would be like, I don't know if I should ask this question. Like, am I going to get laughed at? Is this like something that everybody kind of knows? Whereas at, on like the Asfinges forums or in, in a blog post, they could ask the question and they wouldn't feel like they wouldn't have that, that, um, uh, what, what do you call it? They, they wouldn't have that, um, uh, can't think of the word. <laughs> guess it? Yeah, exactly. So Kaya wrote it really well in her book. So she wrote a book, um, Fear is a Mind Killer. Um, and she wrote, she says that 
because for many of us, doing these activities is how we've always been told against them because they're not ladylike, they're not feminine, they're not blah. Um, when we perform in them, once we start performing, we feel like we cannot fail from there because we are the example to prove, like, it is our job to prove that we can do it. And any failure not only goes against our growth, it goes against any other women who needs to, like, that needs to see that they can actually do it because it just, you just feel like you become this kind of, like, like the source, right? Mm -hmm. You're the very first women that are doing. You're the very first one that are starting to do it. So anyone who's interested to, they're gonna look at you because there's no one else to. Yeah, you. Like and if you're new, new in it, come great. <laughs> you immediately become not, a representative. <laughs> correct. Even if you don't want to. Yeah. And here's the thing: it's terrifying, right? And uh, for example, I do want to point out this real quick. Esfinges does like we are inclusive to the LGBT community. We do focus on women. Because I realized, for there was a time in which I tried to cover everything, and it's so hard. So I had to focus on women, non-binary, LGBTQ, on the women's spectrum, mm -hmm. right? And luckily, I was able to cut that out because there were other groups and organizations that started focusing on the LGBTQ specifically. Mm -hmm. And they do address some women, but we're not the, you know, it's kind of like strange to explain. And it's funny because people who are getting there, it, it gives me the same impression that they're also kind of like struggling with that. It's like, oh God, now I came out, now I need to represent, now I need to perform. And if I fail, oh, it feels worse because you're failing for you and for other people. Mm -hmm. And that's things that also you put you yourself because no one is demanding you to either. Yeah. That's pretty, uh, yeah, it's fun. <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> Well, I mean, we could probably do an entire uh, an entire episode just on his finges, but since you are our guest and you have a personal life too, and you are, I I like to so I when I was writing up these questions, I was like, all right, yes, you do his finges. We'll start with that, but I also want to talk about you in the the three facets, right? So you're a fighter, you're a woman, and you're a coach. And so I kind of based my questions around those three facets. Um, specifically, uh, there's no one one that I, you know, we specifically have to start with, but I had fighter first. Um, so obviously, like, you deal with these kind of challenges in Esfinges, and you deal with a lot of challenges personally. Um, do you deal with, when a challenge comes up, when you have to deal with not, make, not meeting a goal, or uh, not meeting an expectation, do you kind of deal with that the same way in both your your kind of public life and your and your personal and, and your personal growth, or or do you do it differently? Can I flip the coin and make you guys a question? Sure. So for those who don't know, um, coming to the U.S., my husband and I do HEMA, and he's been able to do many things that I've always wanted to do as a fencer for a long time. So in many ways, we are training partners mm -hmm. and he's more experienced than I in certain things. So in many things, he's my coach. So uh, husband, David, I would like you to see, like, have you, how have you seen me struggle when I train? Cause you've seen me push to a level that I had never been able to push before. Right. And without the odds of like couple training, I do want to, I like, I actually want to ask you, how do you see me, dealing with certain challenges compared to your average male student? Oh, well, I thought we were supposed <laughs> to be doing the hardball questions. Uh, um, no, I mean, that's a great question. And it's something that, I mean, we've, we've talked about it many, many times about how difficult it is to have a relationship, like a romantic relationship, and also at the same time have a coach student or training partner relationship um and it's not easy and there's a lot of people that i know that can't can't do it we've kind of figured out how to make it work um but it took a while because there's so many things that that go into it i mean first of all you have a you have a you know an equal relationship where husband and wife right but then you have coach and student which is a there's a imbalance of power there if we approach it that way and uh, we definitely struggled um, at first trying to make it work because we both get frustrated at each other. Um, 
but um, we did kind of figure out how to make it work. And it's been really, uh, it's been really impressive to see um, kind of where, where you've gone with, because I think one of the things when, when you came to the US, um, you already knew how to coach and you already know how to, how to teach, but I think you didn't have as much of the exposure to some of the other things that are out there. Um, and it's been really cool to see you how, how you just quickly you've picked up on just so many things. And like, I mean, your classes are probably the most innovative classes at, uh, at VAF now. Um, so, I mean, it's been really, it's been, it's been a, a long, interesting journey uh, to go from, cause like when we first started dating also, we were, we were just, it, it was actually, I mean, how, how long it was probably eight years ago. No, no. But when we first started fencing, like I, we didn't fence each other for two years, something like that. Like we wouldn't even fence with each other. Um, and, but like in terms of like, cause I know we have had this conversation in terms of gender, like mm -hmm. with me dealing with gender in fencing, because you've seen you've seen some so it's just interesting the question for Colin is interesting to me about how do I deal with with all this baggage as a fencer and you're the one who has seen me like breaking down in tears in the middle of the car because I'm having a conflict over whether I want to fence a women's tournament or not and I'm getting emotional because it's it's for you guys it's simple it's a lot right um and he's seen that breakdown so that's why it's interesting to me for him to see how that works Sure. And that's, that's where I think it is very interesting because, you know, as her, as your husband, right. I want to try to encourage you, but also make sure that you, I don't want to do anything to hurt you. Right. Or to make you do something you don't want to do. But then at the same time, when I'm a coach, sometimes and this is, we've had the same thing uh, in reverse as well with, with you and me, um, that as a coach, I have to kind of push you, right? I have to be like, no, no, you need to do, I know you can do this. You need to do it, right? Because sometimes you're the one who's kind of holding yourself back. But it's a really fine line because it's like, I want to see you succeed. Uh, but I also don't like, it's, it's very difficult to kind of to draw that line where it's like, oh, I can need to push you as a, as a student, but if I push too hard, then it doesn't go, doesn't, doesn't go very well. Yeah. You don't um, want to have to sleep on the couch for the next week. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, well, it's a, it's a really, it's a really interesting dynamic. So I'm going to go to the story, right? And it's like, I've always been in favor of, I've, I've always had a bias towards open tournaments. And for the longest time, I felt like I was not allowed to compete in women's tournaments because if I was a pen defending open, I had to stand where my word is there so I can only compete there. And it was funny because when I started fencing Kima, this is Mexico, different culture. There was a lot of, just like in a tournament, random bro show up. And the one prevalent thing for the first gosh, six years of my FEMA, HEMA career was men screaming at the background, either it's okay, just forget she's a woman, just hit her, to fight her like you fight everyone else, to it's just a girl, it shouldn't be that hard. Like all of these things are kind of like not very cool to hear, right? And then after the match, I will get like, oh, I'm sorry, I hope I didn't hit you too hard, or I had to hit you hard because that's how I fight everyone else, but I mean, I try, like, I hope you're okay, or like, oh, I'm so sorry, I had to, and this one was not in Mexico. It was a guy who came over and told me, I am so sorry, I had to beat you so much, but you were the easy one to get points with. Like, that was my phrase. And I remember fighting over and being like, would you ever say that? to a male competitor. Guy later, later on came to apologize, but that's kind of like the context that I wanted you to get, right? Mm -hmm. And it became funny because as I will fight men, they will get pissed. And now, fencers get angry. Get it, I've seen it. I've seen the three of, I've seen the three of you getting mad in a fight because he's not going your no, way. No, um, never. <laughs> But it will be like a different, like it feels like a different level of frustration in which like 
why is it a woman hitting me, right? And it's not always, but a lot of times, because it really, the response is very different. Like you, it's not a, like a, there's like offensive frustration, angry, mm-hmm. and then there's like a different type of anger. And it's always like that kind of like strange background. So what happened is that I start becoming afraid of hitting men because I was afraid of defeating them because a lot of them were my friends. And I didn't want my friends to be upset about a woman be- beating them. But I could not realize that to myself, right? And then I start putting all this pressure. It's like, you got to beat men. Like, men are the ultimate thing to defeat. So then when I will fence women, I will be, I was super misogynist because I was very dismissive, right? Mm. Fencing women is not nearly as cool. Like, they're not the challenge as, as fencing men is. So I would... I remember having this conversation and David was the one who called me out. It's like, your position about fencing women is entirely misogynistic. And if you're acting that way, being a sphinx, you know, owner, it's, it's kind of cringe worthy. And I was like, Oh, sh-. I broke down like tears, everything. Like I, how could I do this to myself? And now I do both. Right. I was able to kind of like burn myself on that one. Um, I always say that it's of wise people to change of, of opinion. Uh, and I compete in both. I compete in women's and opens. It's still my goal, kind of like in this representation thing, to beat an open tournament. And if, even if I don't, I don't know if I will. It's kind of like my goal to keep having women in opens to give those girls who will be able to beat them the chance to be there. Like, I don't have an interest in to getting them men and women separated. But now I'm like, I enjoy both fencing only women and having the opportunity of, because we're not very many. So it's like, oh, finally, I can fight another girl who's not like a thousand feet taller than me, although a lot of them are still a thousand feet taller than me. Mm. Um, and beat men. But it's really weird because that the, there's just this kind of like strange play. And that's why I always try to explain to people is like a lot of, and not all, but a lot of men just go and fight. And they deal with the stress of fighting and there's a huge emotional process on being competitive and there's a lot of psychology into the idea and that's my favorite part of fencing is the mental game but when you add this awkward baggage to the background it's just it's almost like therapy (laughs) like literally um so so actually um i it's really interesting that you brought up specifically and now this is this is backtracking a little bit but i wanted to hit this this point home a little bit um specifically about you know hearing hearing the the background chatter during a fight whereas like afterwards someone coming up to you and saying oh good job little girl or whatever you know other like afterwards misogyny uh, misogyny versus like during the the thing that i've found and i have only been to a few tournaments that the um that the during the fight to me seems to be slowly progressively getting better to where you don't hear the like call outs so much anymore but the after the fight misogyny seems to be getting worse would you kind of agree with that or like what do you think i don't know i honestly think that it depends on where you are literally like which country you are at Mm -hmm. um and i have a story about that if we have time for that and i also think it depends on where you are at in your head because there's been times in which those screams kind of like throw me down. And there's times when you reach those screams are like, I'm going to throw you. So, no, I need actually kind of like push it. So it really depends. And then it also is like how people see you as a fencer. Cause I think like to me, now that I'm more known, right. Whatever that means, people don't approach me the same way that they used to approach me many years ago. Mm. Um, also the, the community is larger. So some people are really not to do that, but we have a sea of new people who don't have that kind of like etiquette yet to say it somehow who have not learned that that's a thing or who just, again, they come with a cultural baggage in which it's okay to that kind of comments. So I just think it's the same. It's just different amounts of people, different events, who are you looking at is whether it's going to be better or worse. Mm. Well, and I can, I can think of an actually a recent, <laughs> fairly recent uh, example. Uh, so at Serfo, uh, the Southeast Renaissance Fencing Open 2019, 2019. Yeah. It's a fantastic event. Uh, Keith Carter Riley's event. Um, I go to it every year. Um, it's fantastic. Uh, you should go to it. Um, 
you competed in the Sword and Buckler tournament, the Open Sword and Buckler tournament, which was your first Sword and Buckler tournament, right? Yeah. Uh, and you swept your pool. Um, Top 60 on the... Um, yeah, Anderson. I mean, that was super impressive. Um, but I remember in one of your fight, I think it was might have been your last fight. Top 60, top 6, sorry. Yeah, top 16, yeah. Uh, for your first time in a, in a, in a tournament, it's pretty, pretty incredible, or in a sword and bucket tournament. But I remember, I think it was your last opponent, you kept hitting, hitting him, and um, the calls were, were going your way, um, and you could see the, just the level of frustration on the, the opponent's face and, and, in, and, and in his body language, because it wasn't just that it w- you could see it was like, not only is he losing, but he's losing to a four foot 11 woman. Right. And you could see like just the, he was getting so frustrated and, and it actually almost got dangerous um, where he was just swinging for the fences because you could just see the, the frustration. And I mean, that happens anytime. It can happen anytime that when, when you have uh, someone who's losing in a match. Um, I mean, I've had this happen to me many times when I'm, if I'm, if I'm beating someone and I keep scoring on them, they just get more and more frustrated, but you could see that it was different because there was um, almost a, like a different aura there's like a there's yes. like a there's like a misogyny aura about it i don't, also I don't know the difference is that it happens more often that's that's probably true it's a percentage meaning i've and if for example nathan right how many fighters do you get on a tournament on an average how many people get because you always race up to finals and like super high on natural i wouldn't gym. say always but well sure. many times um of, for a tournament, if you give me a rough average, how many people get mad at you because you're beating them? Like, not not fighting intense because they're trying to fight you back, but how many people legit get angry at you because you're beating them? So, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll answer the question in a pretty roundabout way. Um, not a ton of people, but maybe more than the normal person because as a shorter fencer, I have to fence more cleverly. And as I fence cleverly, I thoroughly enjoy making people angry because it makes them easier to fence. So I do it on purpose. So it happens more, but, but I, I understand what you're getting at. And, um, uh, normally like I, I've only seen maybe that I can remember particularly angry, like two, maybe three times in 10 years of fencing at tournaments have, uh, have people like really, really gotten angry other than, you know, like the, the, the frustration and the annoyance that I make them do on purpose. But um, but it doesn't happen at time. Being in the situation in which I'm in a pool of six and five out of those six get mad at me. Yeah, no, that's 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 not normal. And it's every fight I have to deal with someone angry, and angry people don't fight smart, right? And no, there's been times in which he's been yeah. They don't. There's been times in which he's fine, but just that percentage is what he's like. Mm. Same thing. And I'm gonna switch the topic. Same thing that happens sometimes when refing. Now, I'm a grumpy ref. <laughs> Not grumpy, but but I've I've noticed on average when I'm refing, I have more people fighting my calls than other refs. Just in general, maybe I'm awful. Um, but I, I've always and and here's the things like maybe not, but there's always that thing in the back of my head that it's wondering, is it skill or is it woman like because it's also very self-attacking you like i never know i never know if it's my paranoia of like you're obsessed with the topic of women and blah right i mean i'm a woman it's not that i'm obsessed it's just my reality uh i don't know if it's like that kind of like just like i i'm paranoid and i see it everywhere or if it's so then it's also tricky because then i don't know like it gets blurry and I don't know when to accept things and when not to, and when to question things and when take them, and when it's advice and when it's. You know, do you does that make sense? Yeah. It's weird. Yeah. Next question. <laughs> let's let's talk about well not not so much refing but let's talk about coaching since we're there right. Um, so you definitely you definitely coach a lot and you are kind of becoming more known at this point. 
um, it's something that we like, this is kind of gender inclusive. Um, everybody deals with imposter syndrome, but it seems to be something that you've been openly talking about recently, either on uh, Facebook or in, in blog posts and things like that. So um, let's, let's talk a little bit about it or, or just, you know, give us, give us a little, a little introduction to what imposter syndrome is and, and like how, how awful it is. It's, can I, can we swear? Or are we family friendly? Mm, that's family a great friendly. question. I'm going to go with just go for it and I can bleep it out later. <laughs> it's the f***ing mother f***ing on a f***ing on a goat sort of go f***ing awful. Wow. Nasty. Bad. That's actually going to be, I you know what? It. That's going to be fun to bleep out. I'm going to bleep it all out. That was, that was great. <laughs> Uh, no, but okay, so imposter syndrome, <laughs> imposter syndrome, long story short, means you, even if you succeed and you're doing the right thing, you feel like a fraud, and you feel like everything you're doing is wrong, and that you should not be there, and that you're lying to everyone, and then you're, you're bullshit, right? Um, I struggle with it with HEMA a lot. I don't struggle with it with other things, but with him, I'm like super insecure in that matter. Um, and it's always really, it's exhausting to me because I feel like it makes it exhausting on my friends. Like back to capital, last capital clash, having a conversation with Nathan, uh, in which he was like, do you remember when you were like, I'm done with HEMA, I'm going to quit, and now you're finally making it. Because I've always felt, Nathan and I started a very similar time, and I was, I've always felt that with him, uh, Mackenzie Ewing, right, which we were also, there, we're all kind of like that HEMA generation, more or less, um, and I've always felt like I'm behind them. Like, I've always felt like I should be advancing at the same level, and I've always felt like, kind of like, trying to like grasp where they are at, um, and so when I start getting chances as teaching and going to workshops and, um, you know, having kind of like a, people thinking like a voice or something, also with this thing, his people immediately think that I'm the best fencer in the world and I, I know absolutely everything. And I just look at these people who are like, I feel so far behind that when people actually believe what I'm saying it's like no what are you doing this is wrong like <laughs> like don't look at me why are you paying like please pay me I love attention I like attention it's like please pay me attention but don't believe me <laughs> right <laughs> um and it also makes it very challenging because I have a lot of opportunities that I close to myself too because I feel I'm not capable to or I have a lot of projects that I could do good with but I, then I'm too scared hmm. And again, I'm also worried that Nathan and David and you one day are going to be like, you know what? Bye. Like we're done. <laughs> you keep whining like a baby and it's just hiring. And it's because that's, it's true. It's taking on the people that I, because I rely on, on other people. Right. And it's also awful intimidating to me because on one hand, it's important for me, for my students to know that you will feel like you're not accomplishing things because if the coach deals with it, there's no way on earth that they won't. So then maybe they will be more willing to continue through the hardships as a ruining HEMA because they see it as it happens to, oh, and this is Christian state the best of the best, right? Mm. It's a lie. I'm not the best. Um, but at the same time, um, I feel I'm sometimes afraid they're going to be like, ooh, like, if she's so insecure, maybe I shouldn't even be training with her because I'm a, I'm a dojo type of person, right? <laughs> so a, a Hema McDojo. We, do yeah. We're gonna we're gonna try to coin this. Well it was McSal, right? McSal. McSal, McSal. Yeah. Yeah. You heard it here first, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately for everyone. But well, it, oh sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna say, and um that's something that I would also tie I, I think because this this is also this is definitely something that I think every instructor deals with, and especially um, if you also compete because the pressure on yourself and from others to be successful is so huge. And it's mostly yourself, right? Because 
Uh, no one is telling you. No, yeah, well, I mean, that, that yes, but at the same time, if you are supposed to be this high level instructor and you go to this tournament and then you lose or you don't make it to finals, or if it, like there are to some, some people that will diminish you. That being said, your skill as an instructor has almost nothing to do with your skill as a, <laughs> as a competitive fencer, right? Uh, except for the experience that it gives you. Um, I mean, some of the best instructors I know don't compete or um, ha haven't competed in, in years or, or, or never actually competed in HEMA. They might have competed in something else, but they, they, they teach HEMA. Um, but I think that also ties in into it as well. So it's really scary to put yourself out there as well, because then, you know, you're, you, it's, it's very easy to measure yourself by your performance. So your performance as an instructor based on your performance in a tournament, right? Uh, and that's definitely, it, it, it's, I think most people get that, but I think, I think it's, it's hardest for, I know for myself, for me to get that, right? If I, if I'm not successful in a sword and buckler tournament, if I don't win, um, which is like, that's such a ridiculous standard to have on myself, right? That I have to win, right? But at the same time, to me, it's like, oh, if I, if I do poorly, then that reflects on me as, as a, as a instructor. Do you get the same, Nathan? Uh, yeah, to, to an extent. Um, I, I actually wanted, wanted to jump in and say a couple of things uh, about the whole imposter syndrome thing. Um, I think it was last week. It popped across my Facebook feed. I can't remember who it was. It might've been on, on some post by Joseph Brassi, I think. Um, but there were like there was a series of comments about imposter syndrome and uh one of the comments was was pretty was pretty uh pretty good and it said that somebody had told whoever posted this somebody had told them a long time ago that imposters don't have imposter syndrome so like by nature of being concerned that you might not be actually living up to your own expectations that that alone should tell you that you're not an imposter because if you were you wouldn't even be questioning your own validity to begin with which is funny because I was talking with that with with, with uh, Colin. He was like, "Why would you differentiate between fighting imposter syndrome and support like encourage people who should not be there to be there?" And right. I was like, yeah. "If you investigate, if your if your imposter syndrome you translate it into working your butt off and like investigating and researching and listening to people, you're good. If you push yourself to do the things but you don't make an effort, then that's like red lights to me." So, so right, right. From, the, from the, from the student and not a coach perspective though, like, obviously <laughs> I don't, I don't know the, I don't know whether you're feeling imposter syndrome or not. Right. <laughs> so, so how, how can I, uh, a lone, a lone noob tell the difference between a Hema McDojo and a, uh, and like a legitimate instructor. It, it really is. It really is kind of a baffling Yes. <laughs> you don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> no. Um, one, this is as a woman. If your coach flirts on you on the start. If your coach flirts to you on the start, McDojo. <laughs> that's, that's fair. <laughs> if your coach allows you to train with jeans or shows up in jeans or wear jeans and doesn't ask you to take your jewelry off, McDojo. Okay. I'm telling <laughs> I'm you. Sorry. No, true. So very um, specific. <laughs> to, be, to be honest, though, I think I think if your coach is, is, is like is like hitting on his own students, it's more like a McDo ho. Like <laughs> <laughs> no. McDonald. Oh no. McDo no. <laughs> oh no. All right. Well, we don't have a ton of time left, but I do want to specifically talk because, you know, we've talked about you being uh, a woman and we talked about you being a coach, but I feel like we kind of skipped over the fact that like you're, you're specifically a fighter. We kind of touched on it. Um, but I want to, I want to kind of give your students a, that, that insight that you were talking about of where like you go through all the same things at a tournament that any that any other fighter would it's just it is amplified for the fact that you are a woman so you have to uh, un, you know um you have to rep you're essentially representing your gender even though maybe you don't want to 
And also you're a coach. So you're representing yourself as a coach, even if maybe you don't want to. Um, but you still have all of the same kind of things. Like you still have to prepare for a tournament. You still have, you know, jitters. You still have to oh, deal man, with um, making a comeback on like a, a winning or losing fight. So I, it's funny because I've gotten much better now because the thing is when I started competing, I would compete once a year in Mexico, like, which is not good. Any, any coach who tells you competing once a year will not make you a better fighter ever because you need to learn how to deal with adrenaline. You need to learn how you emotionally react to adrenaline and you need to get used to it. And if you do it once a year, you don't get used to it. Mm. Um, so it wasn't until after I moved to the U.S. and I was able to go to a ton of events a year that it started working and making things for me. Um, I am the worst fighter. Like, I'm not not the worst fighter, I'm the worst in fighting, but I am the worst at fighting. I hate myself before competitions. I whine and I ask myself repeatedly, like, why am I doing this? This is stupid. I hate pain. I can't stand hurting. I ouch every single thing. Like, you will touch me and I will be like, Ugh! right? I can't tolerate pain. I hate the idea of bruises. And the reason I started fighting is because I, I deal with, with phobia to dogs for 10 years. And I lived, it, it's very, it takes a lot of your life. And so I started doing HEMA because I thought sorts were cool. But then I was scared of the source. I was like, I'm scared of everything in this life, man. Like, I'm done. So I pushed myself because I didn't want to be scared of it. Now, anytime that I'm winning is great because I'm not afraid. Because I'm like, oh, and I take the punches. But it usually, I'm always like, I don't want to do it. Then I fight. And then after that, I'm like full roller coasters. Like, this is the coolest thing ever. I'm so powerful. Oh. And I sign up for the six tournament. And when the next tournament is coming, I hate myself again. So I'm like. So you're, on, you're on the same roller coaster ride that we were all on. <laughs> so, yeah. So one thing that worked a lot for me is to set up goals that make me not panic about it. So when I have time and I want to do like a big competition, what I do is I do a flip between strength training because I'm tiny and I also like wrestling strength training. And then I go more to like uh, fencing training. So if I can, my ideal well of training is I make six months periods and I start mostly purely on weightlifting, right? Squats, bench press, and deadlifts are like the main three ones and then add stuff from there. I've had to have a lot of help from that. David has helped me a lot. Uh, we were working with Zachary Springer back when he had a coaching program for that. So I go on weight and like building muscle, building muscle, building muscle. And then I progressively move from building muscle to keeping strength. And as I like, keep strength, then I start working on fencing, right? skills techniques tactics and then right at the end of it it's not about learning new things is about consistently applying tactics mm -hmm. uh, and this is another one which david particularly has been great great help because i never had that concept of applying tactics and people think that this is unhuman because here's the thing i love the martial perspective of fencing it saved my life twice from things that i don't want to think about don't use him as self-defense it just happened to work end of quote uh, but I focus like these three techniques or two techniques even and figure out how to make them work every single time so when I fence in a tournament I first focus on making those things work so I can make my way through and then as I'm either succeeding or if I'm like oh there's nothing to lose at this point that's when I start playing with other things but honestly the 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 ability of learning to do that one move against any fencer, to me, that teaches you more, more HEMA than trying to do all the moves against everyone. Because mm. to do the same move against five different fencers, that means that you have to learn five different ways to do setups, have different, five different ways to deal with people's reaction to fencing. Because some people, when they're winning, they go up high. Some others, when they're winning, they get confident and they get distracted. Um, some get like very passive or they get more aggressive. Like the same move will take a minute amount of differences on how people react. So that's kind of like what it focus at the end of the thing. And the tournament comes and then he said, Ugh, I'm not going to do nothing for a week. And we go back.
to the process. And we, I usually do try to frame like the big tournaments, like my main tournament that I'm focusing on, um, which I, right at the moment, right, this last year I had three. It was Seraphil, um, Purple Heart Open, and Capital Clash. Mm. Um, and then any tiny tournament that comes in between, because small tournaments are the best to just like chill and do the things without panicking too much, especially if you're a beginner. Uh, I just kind of like hop in for whenever, whichever situation I am. And the week before the tournament, I do try to um, focus a little bit on what I want to try to do. Interesting enough, and I can see that because I, I'm going to point this out because, again, I work a lot with David, so I'm going to be referring to him a lot. Um, before a tournament, the days before, I don't want to fight because I'm like, the last thing that I want is to get injured. So I'm out. And it's funny because David has the opposite, which before a tournament, he's like, I'm going to fight like a thousand hours the night before. And I'm like, oh, God. So, <laughs> Not the night before. Almost. The night before nah. the night before. <laughs> I've seen him do wrestling the night before a wrestling tournament, so I can... <laughs> but just kind of like a, that, like that, that end part of it, I'm trying to be very chill. And I fence better when I sort of like... Don't give a shit. So before a tournament, like the day off before the tournament, I try to be on everything. So you will see people like music focusing and people will be warming up. And I'm like nervous, like jury, like, <laughs> and I will try to go talk to people like, hi, I'm nervous. <laughs> and then I will be within three minutes and then I'm going to be like annoyed because I'm at one person. I'm going to go to the one person. like, I, I, I'm competing. <laughs> okay, I, and I just do that for the entire time until the tournament counts. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when I fence the best when I'm just like <laughs> I can I can absolutely attest to that too I think <laughs> and now now it all makes sense to me uh you like right before a tournament you turn into like the social butterfly and I'm just like where's Mariana oh she's talking I, to literally everyone cool she you know that. a ton of people <laughs> it makes perfect I, sense I see I learned this in the most ridiculous way ever I used to try to figure it out how to be like a cool getting ready fencer because for example I remember Jake Norwood he will put his headphones and just like, and like, if oh, you don't yeah, know Jake, mm -hmm. when he gets like game face, like he looks like he's going to murder. And I'm like, Ooh, right. And I want, I always wanted to imitate that's cause that. That's what he's planning to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I always wanted to play to that. I always wanted to copy that from other people. And then long story short, Swordfish, while it got stolen from me in Spain, three days before the event, I had no money, no credit cards. The event was, I was about to not go. I managed to get one card the like midnight to leaving at 5 a.m. to the flight. I was able to make the one left like card, saving card, whatever work. So I was able to go to Sweden. It was the most awful week of my life. So I arrived to the tournament and like, I was like, I don't give a shit. <laughs> and it was the best fight I've ever had up to that point in my life. And that's when I realized, like, if I can approach the fight before, like, once in the fight, I do give a lot of shit. But if before fighting there, I could not give a shit. It saves me from all the adrenaline, previous adrenaline rushes. So that's, like, the best mental stage for me. Oh, man, you know what that makes me think of? Uh, I can't remember the movie that's from, I think it's Zombieland, where he's, like, stretching before something. And... Uh, Woody Harrelson turns to him and says, do you ever see a lion stretch before he takes on a gazelle? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, we're, we're right at an hour. So uh, I'm going to go to my, my very last question. Um, Mariana, where do you see yourself in HEMA five years from now? What will you be doing? What are your long-term goals? Oh, that's terrifying. Uh, I've invested <laughs> myself so much in HEMA that I've always said that as an old woman, I expect to be this cranky old lady standing on the top of a stage in an international tournament that I'm running uh, that everyone wants to go to and be like, in my day, this is my day because this is my tournament. So do as I say, I show up on time to your pools um, kind of thing. <laughs> um so I definitely want to I see myself running or supporting running events because that's one of my favorite things. Like, I hate, I, I love the hate that comes with running events. It's awful, and I love every second of it. Like, I love the nastiness of running events. I don't know why. It's like a masochistic situation because it's terrible. It's um, so it's terrible. So, uh, so five I, years from now, when you're 34, you're going to be the cranky old lady One of my goals... Running. 
one of my goals for the next five years is uh, to be invited to teach an international event and to be, I need to work a lot on it, but I want to be recognized internationally as a judge. Yeah, that's a fantastic Because I work goal. my ass, like, refing and judging. Not judge, refing. Like, I want to be recognized as a, as a, as a ref internationally. Um, personally, I do want to have, like, a larger, bigger class in my club. I want to grow the amount of women in my club, particularly. There's topics of inclusivity that I really want to get to, but I did not have to. Learn your pronouns. Even if you don't get them, learn them. It's a lot of work. I don't speak English and I'm learning your pronouns. So it makes you no <laughs> effort to learn one more. Um, uh, so I, I'm trying to like improve the way that I teach. I'm trying to be more include because I have a lot of issues in that. Like I still have a lot of things to grow to. I want to be more inclusive in the way that I teach. And I want to kind of like grow my own program within the club. Like I want to make my, because if you go to VAF, you can see like Berkeley, like Bill classes has like a structure. David class have a structure. Uh, Jonathan Gordon have like, they have like almost like a personality. Each class has a personality. That's the way that I see it. I want my class to have like its own personality as well. Um, and I definitely know tournaments are not that all there is to HEMA, but I want more medals. I'm sorry. And I want my, not in five, I don't think in five years I'm going to get my open tournament medal in Longsword, but I'm going to put it there just to push myself for that. I'm, that's a goal right there. That's a. Because that, that's a goal for every HEMA person. Like long star tournaments are the ones with the most competitors, the ones that people have trained the longest. So like that one is like not an easy take for absolutely no one. I rationally don't think that it might be there, but if I tell that to myself, I'm never going to do it. So win an open tournament. All right. Well, the, the very last thing is where can our, our listeners find you? Uh, uh, I have a newly developed coach Facebook, which I don't know what I'm going to do with it because it's terrifying, imposter syndrome. Uh, you find us, Mariana Lopez, Hema Coach. And you can also find me through anything related to his fingers. Cool. All right. I will post those links down in the description for anyone else. Uh, we are done this week, uh, but thank you for coming on. This has been, this has been a wonderful chat. I like the attention. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, catch us next week. Same time, same place. But without me. Wait. That's true. Next week, our, our guest will be uh, Bill Grandy. So that will be exciting. We're going to be talking about armor and fighting. And it looks, it looks just yeah, like it should this. Yeah, uh, it should be great. Thank yeah. you very much, Mariana. Thank you, guys. All right. Bye now. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.